I just got my driver's license renewed at the uh, Department of Motor Vehicles in Los Angeles. It wasn't too bad. And um, now I'm a valid commodity with the state of California. They can tax me. They can lock me up. They can send me some money that I don't deserve. Who knows what's in the future? Not sure. You're watching Going Viral. And today is the 9th of October, 2024. There we go. I'm seeing everybody. So uh, I already recorded a hello to everybody, you know, generically. So anyhow, did you, uh, you, did you take a look at that attachment I sent out? I think you did, right, Steve? Mm-hmm. Well, I'm, let me. It says mm-hmm. uh, FEMA. Okay. Topics. Uh, behind the headlines on FEMA, I see you mentioned here in the topics, there's a link on California outlawed checking of ID for voting stations. Um, hmm. But there's an attachment, I mean, attachment to the email. I put it all together in one document. Document. What about you, Mike? Did you get that? Is okay. that the one you sent today or the one you sent before, Ken? Well, I sent it earlier. Okay, maybe let me look on that email. Earlier today, I think. Oh, okay, I see it. FEMA. I'm opening it up now. Yeah, and I'll talk. You, are you there with us, Mike? Your mic's not on. There we go. Hi, Mike. Yeah, yeah. So let me just do a little speech about it. Uh, so we're all here. We're starting. So um, I sent out an attachment. I put together from a few different references what's happening because there's a bunch of squawking that uh, I saw like three different newsreels which say Trump is lying Trump is lying Trump is lying he's lying he's he's destroying he's driving everybody crazy what is new about Trump lying he lies I'm a big fan of that that's fine (laughs) so what he said was that uh, FEMA spent their money on housing immigrants And they have no money left to handle the upcoming uh, hurricane that's going to hit Florida and the South and North Carolina, South Carolina, whatever. Mm -hmm. So uh, the administration comes back and says, it's a lie, it's a lie, it's a lie, because there's a dedicated account in FEMA for calamities. And then they had another account where they for refugees. So they did spend about a billion dollars for the refugees and they don't have money uh, for the hurricane or the uh, cyclone. What is it? It's a hurricane. It's a hurricane. They said it's a lie because he didn't say, you know, because that account went dry and we can't take money from the other account and you can't take money from the, from the, uh, calamity account and use it on the um, immigrants. So Trump didn't say any of that. He said FEMA spent the money on immigrants. They don't have any money to handle the um, hurricane. And there's a lot of result. There's a certain amount of television coming up saying that people are very dissatisfied because there's not enough FEMA work. There's not enough intervention by the government to handle the calamity. I think we went through this before with, uh, it was Bush, there was a big uh, hurricane down in Florida and everybody was screaming, you know, because he was on a golf course or something. That's what happens. You know, they, oh, that might, you're talking about George Bush Jr. in 2005 yeah. when Katrina hit Louisiana. Katrina, right, Katrina. You know, yeah. people are suffering and why don't you, why aren't you here to help us? And in this case, now, what, the reason I say the story behind it is because the story behind it, the thing that's much more shocking to me than uh, a snafu of not having funds or irresponsibility and sending people down to help out with uh, the calamity, behind it is, it's called uh, TFA, temporary, what did I call it? Let me just pull it up for my own self self so i think temporary I've, emergency funds of some sort no it's not that at all 
There it is. There we Mil go. Milton's poking through the other side into the Atlantic at this point, so it's all over Florida. Uh, Particularly the West Coast again. No, it's called temporary protected status. So somebody, not the legislature, I don't think, I think this is either in Homeland Security or some, you know, FEMA or somewhere, they selected five countries that will give temporary protected status to refugees from Cuba, Haiti, Nicaragua, or Venezuela. Okay? Mm -hmm. Cuba, Haiti, Nicaragua, or Venezuela. They can stay here, they can work, and so forth, even if this is for illegal, and they're brought in by plane. They're not coming over the border. Mm -hmm. So uh, they got protected status, they can come in and work and, and be like normal citizens because of the, the country well, they're coming from is such a problem. You can't, you can't deport them. And, you can't need to deport the others? Yeah, you can deport people who are illegal if they're not, if they eventually don't get qualified to be um, refugees, a refugee has to be feared for his own existence. Somebody's threatening to kill him or harm him. So forth. Mm -hmm. It can't be a person who's just avoiding uh, going to jail for tax evasion. It's got to be, you know, some kind of a threat. I saw a Republican write up that said of the people, of the immigrants that have been let in so far, 13,000 of them are murderers and about 16,000 of them are rapists. So those how are, can that be? Any, any thoughts on that? Yeah. Have you seen that? Those are people who, this that report came from uh the immigrate the, this administration the bureau of uh, immigrants or whatever it's called i have to look it up but it's not from the gop it's got nothing to do with the gop well it didn't well that's where i saw it is there yeah, information yeah, they're, they're going to be promoting it but it came from i think homeland security because everything got pushed up into homeland security after 9 11. It seems to me that whenever we've been able to identify criminals immigrating, like the 75,000 Cubans that came at one point, we locked the criminals up in jail when they got here. And we made a deal with Cuba to take them back. So how do we let 13,000 murderers into this country? What's really happening with that? Is that true or is that just, you know, an exaggeration? That's the report from uh, Homeland Security. We could discuss that. It's a separate thing. Okay. Well, what and, do you think about it? They're on it. You know, they're they're convicted. They're not just accused. So right. uh, thirteen thousand convicted murderers. Yeah. Why did Why did their states execute them? Why are they sending them here? <laughs> I think a murder is an executable offense, usually in Latin America. You know. <laughs> um. Maybe that's an interesting maybe point. Have, maybe somebody has ulterior motives, but uh, it's less. We're paying the airfare, not not Venezuela or Cuba or Haiti. Mike, what do you have to say? An interesting point. If somebody mm -hmm. was accused of rape and murder in the in the host country, why yeah. would they? Send, why don't they lock them up there? Mike, they were convicted. Ken said thirteen thousand convicted murderers. Mm -hmm. And then almost 16,000 rapists in addition to that. Yeah. And what I heard about that report was that, and again, I don't have the particulars, but from a reliable source of mine, who unfortunately will have to remain anonymous for the time <laughs> being, um, that that report was basically bullshit. Um, when I say well, what the reason was, because I said, is it because the numbers were hyped up or something? And they said, just take my word for it, it's bullshit. 
Okay. Well, I don't take his word for it. I have everybody <laughs> flinging hearsay around everywhere. I like to ascertain the facts, not some trusted source, which most assuredly under Scout's honor. Uh, no, 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 no. I'm true. Uh, no, no, Steve. I'm not putting that out as an accurate report. I'm saying that's what I was told. That's what I know. So oh. after that, I have to speculate. Um, and my my thing is that we've made the United States has made deals to take prisoners, etc. There's been all types of things where people in in totalitarian or authoritarian regimes have been accused of rape and murder because they're really uh, political, unwanted politically. So they've been falsely confused and falsely convicted of those things. This is, I mean, I'm just talking about over the years. People Do you who, remember when we let about 75,000 dissidents from Cuba out? Castro said, okay, go ahead and go. And then they, they like emptied their jails. So we got a lot of criminals and, and we locked them up here and we made a deal with Cuba to take those guys back. Do you remember any of that? I forget yeah, what I president do that. I forget I which president that. that was. It was a Democrat, though. I remember that. <coughs> Carter <Yeah>. or Clinton. <laughs> the idea is we made a deal. There's some details. Wait a second. This is from MSNBC. More than 13,000 immigrants convicted of homicide, either in the U.S. or abroad, are living outside of immigration and customs enforcement detention, according to ICE provided to Congress earlier this week. And now, well, now how do they know if they're, they're outside of detention? How the hell does ICE know that? Well, you can ask ICE. Don't ask me. <laughs> well, you see my point? Because that's the statement that ICE is making. Why are they not detaining these murderers? Or uh, maybe they serve, serve their time. <laughs> I don't know. You don't serve time for murder, Ken. Sure, you should uh, be executed. Hmm. Well, you know, if, if it's accidental, you know, manslaughter, that's different. But if it's murder, you know, there's no, no pardon for that. You don't get out of jail after you murder somebody. <laughs> you shouldn't. Well, yeah, these are good points you're making. But uh, mm -hmm. so, but I'm uh, not getting into this thing with that, the, that they're sending the prisoners over. People, you know, people make allegations. Oh, they, you know, Venezuela is trying to empty their jails. They don't want to deal with these guys. They're sending them up here, mm -hmm. you know, or they have a malicious attitude. And here comes Jim. And Jim's going to know because he knows everything. So, Jim, I'm so glad you came. I've been looking for him all my life, the guy that knows everything. <laughs> yeah, hardly. No, it's not. That's 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 an understatement. That's Alex. You know, that's Alex. He knows everything, and he knows everyone. No, <laughs> no. Anyway, anyway, uh, how are you guys doing? Jim knows so many people. Not only does he know the astronauts that went to the moon, he knows wow. the aliens that they ran into when they got there. You know, really, uh, Kenny. I know you've been in California a long time, and I can revert to very well-known new york phraseology because that's bullshit <laughs> anyway right? anyway okay so uh, anyway, anyway, how you guys doing? people that jim doesn't know but they're all in jail I think. oh they are in jail no if anybody so, jim doesn't know he's got to be in jail as far as yeah, I'm no, concerned. Not, oh. so jim here's the story i was starting to talk about the uh kerfuffle that's going on about whether or not the Biden administration or FEMA through FEMA underneath the Biden administration wasted money, a billion dollars handling uh, immigrants, and now they don't have funds to uh, handle the upcoming hurricane, which is named after a guy, I forget his name. Milton Eisenhower. Milton, yeah, yeah. and that's going to hit. Mil Milton, Milton. Milton, right. Yeah, I, I, yeah guess, I, I, just, I just got on a Penelope meeting so I can move into the bedroom and watch. I understand it made landfall, but anyway. We'll yeah. So it's broken through into the Atlantic now. It's gone across. It's all over Florida, central yeah, Florida. It's just, um, you know, because uh, someone told me they recently went swimming in the Gulf of Mexico, <clears> and <throat> the temperature of the water was like being in a bathtub, a hot bathtub. That is so mm -hmm. weird. Mm -hmm. Wow, so weird. And, and so well, that... any of these morons who don't believe in global warming, boy, I'd like to take them and stick them into that bathtub mm -hmm. head first. I don't believe in global warming, but I do believe in Jesus. Well, I'll stick you in there. Jesus what? Christ is coming back. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> uh, well, actually, actually, today I deal with some guy who was showing a think- documentary about Jesus Christ and animal abuse. I said, Jesus, boy, I never heard that one before. Anyways, your question. Is but the question is, is so that. one second. So I was bringing that's been problems. ridiculed and disproved uh, all over the national media. That basically that's a bunch of bullshit, saying that they overspent money on dealing with uh, migrants and they don't have any money. I mean, I, if, I can certainly the, understand why the Republicans would bring that up during an election year right now, but I think that that's uh, absurd because FEMA essentially said, "Yeah, we're ready to go," and we got the money to deal with it. So it's not. It's ridiculous. It's just. It's just. Very clever on the part of certain people in GOP. Oh, no, 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 Jim, you're off. Actually... you're off on this. Biden uh, said, and uh, and other people said, the spokespeople said, yeah. no, there's scheduled money. There's no more. I think it was Biden said that the, uh, that account, that budget is used up. We don't have any more money. He tried to get the head of the House to pass a bill to get more money to FEMA because they don't have money to handle the next uh, hurricane. I'll tell well, you something. I've got to throw in a point of information, guys. Yeah. Um, if I can get a word in edgewise here. All right. But uh, the the government did edgewise. call up. Uh, did call up um, Ron DeSantis, I believe, and said, uh, "Yeah, we we um, we'd like to talk to you about getting funds, um, um, hurricane relief funds, to your state." And he wasn't answering the call because he felt it was of a political nature, and he didn't want to be manipulated politically so he refused to take the calls where'd you hear that mike hmm? no no i heard that from de santos well, well, was driving was, home yeah, de santos said, called you up and told you that ken no he, yes, he was I, on the radio and what he said I mean. was uh, kamala uh kamala 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 and I'll call her anything you want. It's three syllables oh, kamala kamala what who cares he, said, he has she hasn't been down here in the four and during any calamity that's happened to Florida, at least three different times, hurricanes hit. She's never been here. Now she shows up to get press because she's running for presidency. I'm not interested in these games. And it's absolutely critical that Biden and said, Kamala handle the situation, handle Helene and now Milton. That's absolutely critical to the election <laughs> because wow. if you show a dysfunctional government, the Democrats are going to lose. They have well, to show that they can handle this. Right. And that's, and that's why, Steve, this is being raised as a bullshit issue. I mean, have, well, you, ever what, been, have you ever been in, have you ever been in Florida after a fucking hurricane? I have was a kid. I'll never forget that. And, you know, I've been out in Long Island when it got clobbered by a hurricane. And I've been out in uh, the boroughs of uh, the city of New York after Hurricane Sandy. Do you agree with me that the administration has to handle this absolutely, absolutely. perfectly? Ab- well, they're, yeah, I agree 100%. And so I if just, there's no yeah. money, you just crank up the fucking printing press. Hell yeah. There's, you don't need anything else. You got to make it look like those that, that cotton and linen things that they hand out for money, uh, that other people take it. That's all they need yeah. to do. And they need to get a lot of that out there because there's so much destruction. Yep. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, these hurricanes are just... I mean, look at, I mean, we, we have a close friend who lives in Tampa and I don't know where the hell she is. She just got out of having uh, surgery in North Carolina. She had to go up to North Carolina <laughs> to get a surgery up in the, uh, you know, where the, where University of North Carolina is up there, where Duke is, Charlotte. And then she no, had to come back down because she couldn't find decent medical care in the state of Florida. So she's in the path of this goddamn hurricane. Uh, two Tampa. hurricanes. <laughs> yeah, right. She first had Helene, and now she's got this crazy shit going on. And we were trying to get her on the phone. I don't know where the hell she is. So when Gail comes mm-hmm. back, we're going to try to track track her down. But uh, yeah, you know, this is, someone you know, okay? Yeah, someone I know. Yeah, but you know, I, I mean, I I just think that this is ridiculous to think that the federal government's not going to respond. I mean, yeah, sure. If I was running a very tight race, as it's going on right now, we this going to be. Uh, a uh, flip of the draw here, this election race. Uh, yeah, I I pick any kind of negative to uh, heighten up because you know Trump makes up bullshit anytime he wants, and uh, you know <laughs> every other he, sentence. Yeah, and, and and it's not to say the Democrats are guilty of making you know half true statements because of course they are, but uh, you know this is definitely something I would do if I was them. Like, oh wait, they're not going to help you out in the middle of a hurricane. 
Yeah, Christ, <laughs> give me a break. The, 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 any incumbent government with a close race like this is going to make goddamn sure that they're going to help out as much as they goddamn can people. And they, and, and that's what the federal government's for. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Help. I mean, that's why we have a government. And, and it gets into this whole question of like some of the people who are part of the Trump coalition, because I think it's a disparate coalition. It has all sorts of different, uh, you know, uh, libertarians, you know, right wing, right wing, racist, Nazi types. There's there's a certain percentage of them like that. Not all of them, but libertarians, uh, uh, Christian fundamentalists. They're a very strong part of it. I've I've seen these topologies, and some of these guys, they just have no faith in the federal government. And uh, look at all the nine one one stuff. I mean, you know, I'm not a nine one one conspiracy theory guy. I'm not at all. And uh, what's you know, a nine one one conspiracy theorist? What are that? What's that? Oh, um, <laughs> well, you know what tell that, me what you're not. Well, I'm not somebody who thinks that George W. Bush decided to blow up the World Trade Center. I don't feel that. How did He's never Center qualified come? to have that level of security. He would how never did, be informed about it. How did Building 7 come down? That's always the one they come up with. And then I, I've been in, in passion fights. I've been in what? passion fights with architects screaming at can i had a, a party once i'll never forget and uh this is when i was living with drake uh michael will remember these big parties we used to have and yeah. um uh, and there was an architect a couple of architects who taught down at uh at cooper union and they just sat there and got into this huge fight with the 911 conspiracy theory types because of that building seven thing and their whole argument was that uh the reason it came down was simply because the structural integrity of the building Got clobbered because of the huge impact of both buildings falling. They uh, didn't. They didn't get hit by that at all. They, there was a few well, bit. Well, he's saying that it, it, it started fires, but they were not contact with either of the towers in Building Seven. Yeah, but uh, Jimmy's let saying me, that the uh, Steve. Uh, let me cut in here for a second. Um, we could first go all of all, night talking about this. Yeah, the structural impact on, on Building Seven didn't come from just things hitting it. There was no structural impact on Building 7. There was Period. a structural impact on Building 7. A bit there of was debris. A structural impact on other buildings there. And I felt there was a structural impact on buildings in Brooklyn Heights because of the vibration that came under the river. And I was in Brooklyn Heights at the time, well, so I know that. Well, no, so I was downtown. Is, yeah. Well, yeah. I was downtown in Lower Manhattan when Building 7 fell. I was over on Wall Street when Building 7 fell. Yeah, I told you. And he's there. That's, and that's when they got evacuated. That's when they evacuated all of us. And because we had to leave where we were at 120 Wall Street. And, you know, it's a fair question, Steve. I mean, you know, let, like. Let I, me, I, give, I, let me I, give you a real quick rendition yeah. of the truth as I see it. Okay. They sat there for eight hours after the Twin Towers went down. And they wondered what they're going to do about it because the plane that went down in Pennsylvania was probably scheduled to hit Building 7. And right. they had it wired up for explosives, and they knew they couldn't allow anybody to come in there and discover that. So eight hours later, they decided to pull the plug. It's absolutely inexplainable. Uh, what you're coming up with is absolutely just is so insufficient. And beyond that, you got the Pentagon, and beyond that, you have everything else. It's massive, oh. and it's brain control. I had friends who were in the Pentagon when it got a when it got hit. One of my one of my good friends was in the goddamn Pentagon when it got hit. So what? So well, what? It, wasn't, it wasn't a mythological attack of a plane. It was a fucking. What plane do you mean mythological attack or a plane? What are you talking about? Well, some people, of course, argue that the attack by the plane hitting the Pentagon didn't happen. I find that to be ridiculous. It wasn't hit by a 757. That's for sure. Oh, all right. Well, that's 757s. Right, well, excuse right. me. If and you, you're right. If you have any friends, if you have any friends that are commercial airline pilots, pilots. ask them how fast can a 757 fly without falling apart. <laughs> they can't go the speed that they were recorded well, going okay, into the hold, building. Oh, that's interesting. Ken, Guys, I haven't heard that. Steve, I got to yeah. ask you a question. Steve, right. where, where were you on 9-11? You um, were in Los Angeles, I, you guys. I, No, no. Where I was it? in Russia. I was oh. taking a tour from Moscow down to Stalingrad on the Volga River. 
And huh. everybody on the boat, I was the pet America, and they're coming up to me and saying, oh, horrible, New York, Washington, uh, Pittsburgh. And I'm going, okay, I can see New York and Washington, but why Pittsburgh? <laughs> Well, they, that, and then that, I that. didn't know that the buildings actually fell down because there's this really crappy television in the lounge and everybody was trying to watch. So what I, I, I got a good hotel room in Stalingrad and I had CNN and, and uh, BBC and I was astonished. I, you know, I looked at the TV and I go, they fell down. How could they have fallen down? Oh, They're yeah, engineered was, to be hit by planes. They couldn't yeah. fall down. It's also totally bogus, wow. and it's also it's brainwashing. Yeah, oh, but oh, look, oh, I, oh, look, oh. have you ever been in the buildings? Have oh, you ever been in the buildings? I've been in the building. I interviewed with American Express there. I had lunch on the 106th floor. Which one? The North or South, South Tower? South Tower. It's right, right over the right. Statue I, I of Liberty. Was South Tower. I was in the South Tower on and off. At one stretch for six months, seven months, I was on grand jury duty. They had a white oh, wow. collar grand jury in the South Tower. I mm. had, used, we had a client in the South Tower that was the client that that and uh, that had the largest casualties, Cantor and Fitzgerald. And I used to go in and deal with those guys all the time, and you know they had the largest amount. I think they had a couple of, of the, at least a thousand people from Cantor and Fitzgerald were killed in in that oh. terrible thing, and. When you got up in the beyond the when you had to switch at a certain level to the to the tap the elevators to take you up to the top, it was mm -hmm. weird to be standing because you could actually feel the goddamn building sway in the wind. I, I could feel the vibration in the floor all the time. Yeah. I, I didn't know what it was, but I did. Yeah. Uh, all I could the floor was vibrating all the time. Yeah, yeah, it was weird. It was okay. weird. It was very weird. So, and yeah. they only rented out half of that building. It was a white elephant yeah. from 1970 when it came online. There was no interest for terrorists to knock down the World Trade Center, but no. they sure wanted to get rid of that so they could redevelop that land. Yeah, well, okay. Okay. wait a minute. Let me bring yeah. something in here. And it was full of us. I was online first, Ken. Hold yeah, it. I know you were. I just want to bring okay. one up. All right, now. wait. Before you one thing that Steve can tell us that nobody here seems to know. Steve, how many architects are part of architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth? What um, approximately? Wait, you got to unmute, Steve. You got to unmute. How many architects and engineers are part of architects and engineers for 9-11? Last time I saw Richard Gage, he appeared at our, our UFO group. And we went and had uh, some drinks with him afterwards. And this was about seven or eight years ago. And at that time, there was 1,500 to 1,600 members that were architects and engineers. Okay. I actually Thank knew you. that Get question. Get that, Jim. I don't know who you were talking to, but there's 15,000 right. architects and engineers. 1,500, Ken. not what the government said. 1,500, not thousands. If you guys want to talk among yourselves. Okay, no, 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 we're done. No, no, Ken, let Mike talk. No, 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 don't worry about it. I mean, you you got a good conversation. No, 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 no. No, we want you to join the conversation. What do you have to say? No, what do you mean join the conversation? I've been trying to join the conversation for the past 10 minutes. You succeeded. Go ahead. You have the floor. Everybody else is muted, including me. There was a reason I was asking you where you were and where Ken was, was in Los Angeles. Jim was in New York and I was in New York. So don't you think there might might be a possibility that we might know a little bit more, those of us who are in New York and in, in viewing distance of what happened, that we might have a little bit, might have a little bit more information than people who weren't in New York. Sure. Okay. Go on. So therefore, I mean, I know people who, first of all, who saw the planes hit. Yeah, okay. the planes hit. I didn't. I saw one of them fall, but I didn't see. Uh, I didn't say the planes hit. These are people. I know they're not lying to me. Okay. Otherwise, that's not an issue. We know the planes hit. So what? So what are you saying? The planes hit, but you're saying that there were people that felt people there was no reason the terrorists had for knocking down those fields well buildings. that's also but the thing is that the buildings were engineered to reset to withstand the collision from a dc-10 all right they were bigger planes but they were still engineered so they wouldn't fall down the central core is that strong the except for one thing they're designed to, to 
they may have been designed to suffer the impact, but not from uh, planes that were loaded up with fuel. And the fire. No, no, they were designed with planes that were loaded up with fuel. A DC-10, a smaller plane, when there was really? came online in 1970. Yeah, I don't know any building that could that wouldn't be substantially damaged by fuel oil being. Uh, um, oh yeah, substantially damaged, but not collapsing. Well, damaged to the point where they could collapse. All right, you Mike. Know, I, don't, I don't mean to was, question your religion. Go ahead. I, I don't. The mean Titanic to... was also unsinkable, but it sank. No, it wasn't unsinkable. Well, they That's said not it true. was. So we what? Said That's they more may have said that the buildings were were uh, able to withstand the impact of a fully fuel loaded DC ten, but that doesn't mean it will always happen that way. Yeah, they okay. may have been wrong, or they may have been pumping, just hyping it. So the fact that we talk about you're something going to believe. Be if you're going to believe a conspiracy theory, you should also be open to the fact that maybe the report about it being able to withstand the impact of a fully fueled up DC-10. Mike, maybe I'm not talking about the theories. Wrong with that report. And Mike, I'm not well, talking about the theories. I'm talking about the facts. I haven't broached well, any theories it? about who did it. I'm well, talking about no the fact. facts. There's no The only fact on whether or not it was able to um, withstand the a fully fueled airliner um, impacting it. The only fact we have about that is that it wasn't. It wasn't able to because it it it's no longer there. So that oh, yeah, but it's not the from the airplane thing, that's not there. The close you don't believe that the World Trade Center isn't there anymore. No, no Mike, why don't you listen to what I say instead, instead of destroying? I'm asking it. you. I, I says. I said it wasn't from the planes that it fell down. There were explosives and it was blown up. So in other words, they they set the explosives and timed it to the exact, almost the exact point that the planes hit. No, no, or no. We saw an opportunity at that point to collapse the buildings when the plane hit. Mike, do you want to modify your, your take on 9-11 at all? If you don't, then we don't need to talk about this. Let's talk about something you don't believe to be true. Yeah. Not 9-11. Well, look, I don't need to talk about something. You brought up the topic. We were talking about whether or not the topic that Ken brought up was whether or not that uh, um, FEMA or the emergency, all the emergency right. agencies ran out of money. That's what we were talking about. You brought up the 9-11 thing. Yeah, um, let's, I, let's, I apologize. <laughs> okay. Let's go back to the subject that yeah, uh, let's go back to the subject the because the 9/11 we could to the rest of 2025 we could talk about it from the beginning to the end. So you know, from like five years before it happened to 20 years after, and the hearings and everything. And I do want to say one last thing: there's a long history of steel buildings which burned and then collapsed. And the long history is 9-11. It never happened before, and it never happened after it. That's no true. steel building ever collapsed from a fire that totally destroyed everything in the building. Guys, fall down. Guys, so it's just 9-11. You can believe whatever you want. Nobody, I can't facts. convince people not to Trump vote for Trump. I can't convince people uh, uh, to change their thoughts. And I'm not well, wait, as long as we all agree Jesus is going to come back and save us. Yeah. And if we don't Jesus came back, he'd leave in 30 seconds. <laughs> right. I agree. Okay, now let's, let's go back, back to, to your topic. Let's get yeah. back to my topic. So uh, in an email that I said, update, I attached a bulletin about uh, the FEMA thing, about not having money and so forth. But underneath that is um, temporary protected status, TPS. And there are five countries that somebody selected and said immigrants from those countries get special status, they can work, they can't be deported, and they get benefits. And I don't know who picked those five countries. But after that, in the same article, that's the TPS. And those are the five countries. And, that's, and that comes up from, well, what is FEMA spending their money on? Because they send these people like 35,000 to some little town in Ohio, and then 
the federal government sends money to nonprofits that help feed them and clothe them and house them. And I heard one, I think I heard it on a recording, I didn't read it, that a church in some little town got, you know, $12 million, not a lot of money, but all they were doing was acting as counselors and, you know, seeing that these guys are not abandoned and they're okay. That would be in addition to everything else. These are like make them feel at home. So, and you have 15 countries in your handout. In your yeah, handout. You now that. that's the other part. You those, should do that. All of those Ken, countries. You should do that. You should become a counselor. You get 12, 12 million bucks. That's pretty good. Yeah. For 12 million bucks, that's not a bad deal. So the, in that article, there's all these other countries that are listed as candidates for TPS. And I, I'm, I'm, I don't have a problem admitting I am prejudiced. I think everybody has prejudices. There's cultures I like better than other cultures. It doesn't mean that I'm going to discriminate or harm people or deny them the same rights as other people. But I would measure people by their competence, trustworthiness, initiative, uh, politeness, or ability to get along, how good jokes they tell, rather than uh, any of those categories that are considered to be uh, special cases. But, but the thing is, all of these countries are lowball countries. You look at them. There's nothing in there. You don't see Spain, Italy, France, Germany, Lithuania, Iceland. You don't see uh, North Vietnam or Russia or Korea. You just don't see anything that's in the Western civilization. You only of course see not. Middle of course Eastern not. countries and uh, mostly uh, drug cartel company uh, countries. You know, but they got Syria and Ukraine and, and uh, Venezuela and so forth. You know, just why are they making that a special? These are the people who have to come into the United States. This Ken, is, there's no drug crazy. cartel countries on this list. I mean, Venezuela I mean, maybe, but there's no drug cartel countries on this list at all. You don't think Under, so? No, none of them are dealing in, in Venezuela, maybe trafficking there, possibly Nicaragua. But that's very little. It's not like Mexico. So drug cartels are not a, a salient issue here. My, Mexico's not listed. No, no Mexico. Oh, we have too many immigrants from Mexico to put that on the list. That's right. So mm -hmm. that's who's making this policy. This is not the kind well, of policy. There are wars. My, even hot let me wars. finish my question before you. Sorry. These kinds of questions are very significant to the culture of this country. And it's it, it's everybody should have a right to participate in deciding what our immigration policy is. It looks to me like it's coming from a select group of elitists who have an attitude about what's supposed to happen. Or maybe they think we're like a, a welfare company, uh, you know, well, welfare to the world and we should be Christian. And if anybody's hungry in any country in the world, we should have them come here for dinner. I don't know where this comes from. And I was wondering if you guys know. I suspect what should we do, Ken? From the UN. What do you recommend, Ken? What should we do? Ken, uh, revolt. <laughs> first of all, there are we have agencies in the federal government. People work for them, and uh, they're assigned certain tasks. Um, they're paid, probably uh, a decent salary, to work on these tasks and come to these conclusions. We can't have a vote. On every single, I mean, if you if, if you think that people should vote, you know, we should have a plebiscite every time we have to decide, okay, what countries should get special aid this when year, what okay. countries next year. That's why we have these government agencies. You may think that we have too many of them or they're not doing their job. But the fact of the matter is somebody's got to come to that conclusion, got, um, has to analyze the data and come to their own conclusions and then make these decisions. So if you're asking who made these decisions, probably those people, I don't know who they are. We don't know their names. Those people who have been assigned this task. Okay, so uh, you're saying there's an assigned group of bureaucrats, appointed, not elected, who make decisions about the future of this country in terms of its wait, demographics. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, right? first of all, there are always an assigned group of, not let's say civil service people, 
um, people working for the government employees who are making decisions that affect this country because we cannot vote on every single decision that may affect this country. I don't think Ken was saying that at all, Mark. Oh, no, 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 no. We, this is a republic. We have re representative democracy. We don't have right. to have a, a, a you know, a, a na national plebiscite for every decision, but we elect our leaders and they have a what they call a constituency, the population that they're representing, you know, in their the, uh, congressional district or the, in the state. And then they, the, the, the public can at least approach them or their secretaries and staff and say, I don't want us to have 46 languages in every high school. I want to stick with Western civilization and teach, you know, and keep these Latin languages. I'm, I'm okay on that. But I don't want us learning 47 different languages and, and putting a school burden and, a, and an electoral burden in every, in every election to carry 46 different languages all the time. Well, I think it, it violates. So if you push, you can push on your representative and find somebody who'll stand up for your viewpoint and vote for them or not. But it doesn't require a national plebiscite to make these decisions. Okay. I'm saying these so decisions are made outside your of local that. representative and tell them what you just told us. Yeah. We can't do anything about it. Yeah, well, I know. I'm, I'm not asking you to do something. I'm wondering if anybody knows who's been making these decisions. You're yeah, it should be Biden. Biden determines the policy of the government, what they're going to do with the, with the refugees. It yeah. comes from Biden, and then he directs his, his different, different departments to do what they need to do. Same old thing. Well, but, to, okay, you think it's Biden. How many immigrants have come into this country? You guys got any idea? I hear between three and five million Anybody have a better figure than that? This is, we live in a nation of immigrants. So we, we, we're, we're that? we should constantly be taking in immigrants. The, the no, I'm talking about the ones that the Republicans are objecting to. How many, how many millions have we taken in this recent uh, in, oh, inflow? 10, 10 to 15 million. Wait, no, wait. I don't think it's whoa, that high. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. That, that's, that's, Where are you getting those numbers from? Oh, from the hey, Ken, uh, Ken, will you unmute Jim so he can talk? Yeah, no, he's got to unmute <laughs> him. It, can't you unmute, unmute him? Jim usually shows up as a courtesy, but then he spins off. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jim. Come on. What's your answer? Who's making these decisions? So we don't know. Okay, I don't know either. All I know right. that, but about I have you know, and uh, you're right. I should talk to a congressman that got that answer. Or, or a senator. So next topic. Oh, what was the top we were talking about before? Uh, the topic was whether or not we used up the money for emergency funding for for Hurricane Milton because right. of, of of immigrants. As right. far as I know, we have not used it up. I don't didn't hear Biden say um, we have no money for that. I didn't hear any of these reports. I just was looking at an article again about Ron DeSantos refusing to take um, um, calls uh, call from Paris, but he said in the same article, in this article, um, his staff said he did not, has not spoken to Biden in the past few days. Biden says he, uh, apparently the White House said they've been trying to contact him. And he said he did speak to Biden in the last few days in the same article, said it, it gave both sides. So he's claiming he did. His staff and the White House is claiming he didn't. So, you know, make your own decision. But the fact of the matter is, apparently there is money or there is help available for Florida, whether or not DeSantis is making use of that or not, that's another matter. Uh, basically, at this point, we'll have to see what happens. Okay, I, I got another piece. To politicize emergency help, I don't care who, which side does it, would be, and, and again, I agree with Jim, uh, um, the Harris campaign would have absolutely no reason to withhold funds for political reasons. The Republicans would have incentive to withhold accepting those funds or to um, bollocks up the works 
for political reasons, but that doesn't mean they're going to do it because it might help the uh, um, the presidential campaign. Okay, so okay. It won't help DeSantis. Okay, I just looked up for a reason here. People who ask, why are so many FEMA jobs unfilled? In a report last year, the nonpartisan government accounting office found that 35% of FEMA's positions were unfilled, partly because of rising disaster activity during the year. Okay, this, and it was a scenario that they, uh, FEMA has 11,400 employees. That's a gap of 35%. Wait, 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 hold, hold. I think 35% of wait. people to go out and help. Ken, question. Yeah. The article said that the reason they were unfilled, the jobs were unfilled, was because of the number disaster of- Disaster activity, rising disaster activity. Well, what, is what that FEMA That doesn't make sense. Huh? It doesn't make sense. If there's rising disaster activity, then you'd have more jobs filled. Yeah, well, more jobs available, but they're not filled. Yeah, well, a lot of people don't want these FEMA jobs. Why they aren't filled. They don't, people don't want to do this work. They don't want to do federal emergency management work. That's why they're unfilled. Well, that makes sense? there's also the fact that during, I mean, there were cuts during the uh, Trump administration. And there have been attempts to block not all these positions, but some higher positions from being filled all across the, the board in government um, by the Republicans in the House. Well, maybe, so, but I they're mean, still they're trying hard. to fill it. There's about 4,000 jobs they have open and that, that they're cleared to be filled and they're not being filled. The Republicans well, are not standing in to oppose them. Well, the Republicans are opposing certain jobs, in other words, certain jobs in which there are applicants, but they're not approving. And that's not the case here, yeah. not with They're these not FEMA jobs. But that only has to do with the higher level jobs. That's not, I mean, in other words, the, the, um, uh, the, not the House, no, no branch of the government um, is going to go approving every single person that works for FEMA or something. Um, that's not their they, job. That's what the, the, no, right, the exactly. Secretary of Homeland People, Security does. Mayorkas, you know, almost got impeached. <laughs> but no, no, no. But the people who are... Um, but they have blocked certain positions from being filled. Um, oh, yeah. And those are the higher level positions. Exactly. The administrators. Whether right. or not that has an effect on the lower positions, the fact that there's nobody running the show because the candidates for the for running the show, running the, running that agency cannot get approval um, from the Republicans in the House um, or the Senate for that matter. Um, but the idea is that's an open question whether whether there's a trickle down effect on on that uh, on the lower echelon people because there's nobody in charge. But, you know, this yeah. press secretary for Biden is saying that the, the reporting of thirteen thousand uh, murderers is just not true. It's a false representation of the facts, contending it was important to correct the record and call that out. That's what Jean Pierre said. John Karen Jean Pierre, she's the press secretary for Biden. Yeah, she says well, it simply isn't true. Oh, well, that doesn't woman? mean it's not true. That's the press secretary. Press I don't believe secretary. it's true personally, but I don't have any. There's, I haven't seen any hard evidence to back it up. By the way, I think she does you, a good job because she says what she knows. No, I like her. Whatever she's, whatever they tell her to say, she says it. What are, what do we expect from her? Well, she does a good job. That's what the press secretary is supposed to do. And that's what she's supposed to do. I know. Take I think the flag from the press so the president doesn't have to. Uh, <laughs> I can't. Right. Sorry. Cover his ass, you know, and then and she mm -hmm. does. Right. She does a little bit of dramatic stuff sometimes when she gets in an argument. But yeah, uh, she really. I think she handles her well when you know when I she's toe to toe too. with some of these people. I think so too. She's attractive. She's articulate. You can understand her. She doesn't mm -hmm. lose her temper, really. She's not burned out yet. You know, She's not burned out yet. Wonderful. Yeah. And then, <laughs> and the other thing was, she actually had a long or a reasonable history. She didn't just come there right off the street. She was working in that uh, division or something for quite a while. I got a number from the Office of Homeland Security Statistics. They estimate in the country now there's about 11 million unauthorized immigrants. But that's over every, all time. You know, I, I know several people that are illegal. My mechanic isn't illegal, but he does good work. <laughs> it doesn't mean they came in last month, right? 
No, no, this is the total of their estimating. That's um, Homeland Security statistics. I don't know how many have come have in. A, maybe three to four million that the Republicans are objecting to over the last decade. Or maybe less. Well, I, I have a, um, a topic, if you want to discuss it, although I don't okay. know, um, is that uh, two days ago, it was the first anniversary of October 7th. Right. <laughs> now, there were all across the, the U.S., I mean, in, all across the world, there were commemorations for the people who were killed on October 7th. Um, some of them were, yeah, you know, let's help, you know, Israel prosecute this war. But most of them were just commemorations uh, for the dead. They were, they seemed to be pretty much apolitical because there were people there who supported the Netanyahu government, people there who didn't support the Netanyahu government, who were against it. But they were commemorating the people who were killed on October 7th. On that day, there were also demonstrations, apparently, from what I can gain, and people have any specific information, demonstrations against Israel um, for the Palestinians. Now, again, if you have a demonstration and you say, yes, the people who were killed on October 7th, it was a terrible thing, but we, we also want to bring to attention the, you know, the, the people in, in Gaza who are dying or in Lebanon. Oh. That's fine. You're still allowing the commem commem commemorations to go on. You're not dishonoring those commemorations of the dead, of the innocent mm -hmm. people that were killed. However, there were some demonstrations, apparently, from what I can gather, in which, um, from what I've heard in the news, and again, if you guys have harder evidence uh, for, for or against this, let me know. You have a contentious point? that there were some demonstrations that were like pro-Hamas that were celebrating this, uh, you know, celebrating as, as a victory. And there were some people, a lot of demonstrators who were, um, I mean, if there was one day, let's put it this way, if there was one day during the year that you shouldn't be celebrating or, pro, you know, or trying to put the blame on Israel or something for what happened happened on October 7th, it would be every October 7th. You kind of like, this is my opinion, you don't go to somebody's funeral, no matter how much you hated them, and spit on their grave, unless you want to shit kick them. But the fact is, so what I wanted to find out is, does anybody have any information on how many demonstrations? Because I've just been getting it from media reports, but they haven't been very specific on how many demonstrations there were that would that could be considered disrespectful of the people who were murdered on October seventh. You guys hear anything or anything? Ken? Well, I'm sorry, but there's something else. What's the question? Is celebrations or memorialization of the October seventh uh, mass? Were there pro-Palestinians demonstrating joy at the killing of 1,200 Israelis was on October 7th? October 8th. There was a lot of report of that. No, 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 no. I'm talking about two days ago. Oh, I don't know. Well, the, the, what happened in Colombia? That's the big central point. Well, about what happened in Colombia? Yeah. Who knows who was there? But Columbia University. Oh. You know, in New York. No, but Mike, when do you think that they'll, and what do you think would be the proper celebration of the 40,000 Gazans murdered by Netanyahu? When should well, that be celebrated? I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't go around celebrating it at, at the funerals of any of them. Yeah, that might be unwise. Right. But should they, should they, so what sort of mourning should they go into to commemorate that, um, considering that? I'm just I, really to me, it's not even a matter of of uh, whose side you're on. It's just a matter of civility. Would and as we know, um, as Donald Trump, among others, has, in my opinion, has so been so fervently trying to get rid of the very notion of civility. But the idea is yeah. that if we can't have this kind of like respect for each other and as human beings on the very basic level, okay. All right, they just look. I'm going to fight this guy. 
as as much as I can. But he just lost his dad or his wife or whatever. Let him go. It, it, it just happened today. Let him go. Or this is the one year anniversary. Let him go on that one. I just find there's something because we talk about inhumane. We talk about inhumane. What Hamas did. Inhumane about the um, the what the Zionists did. Any inhumanity there? What the Zionists are doing? By the way, be careful when you say Zionist. Okay. The Zionist. Um, I'm a Zionist, but okay. I ain't a Netanyahu type of Zionist. Did not Netanyahu commit war crimes at this point? Well, they're all committing war crimes. Who? Who else? Hamas, obviously. Hezbollah. Okay. And now the Netanyahu government seems to be, uh, well, I don't know. Some of them are dubious, but there are some that I would consider war crimes. There was a couple of incidents. But to see in a war when, you know, in other words, you could say Hamas is committing war crimes by putting their fighters in civilian areas. On the other hand, where else are they going to put them? Uh, there you go. It's not that big a place. They don't have bases. They don't have that that kind of army um but on the other hand if that's where they are located would the um israel attacking in other words if hamas has a is operating from a building from which they're firing rockets i'm just giving an example and israel hits that building and 20 civilians are killed there because they happen to be where hamas is firing the rockets is that a war crime Look at the disproportionate no nature of this. 1,200 Israelis died, and over 40,000 Palestinians have been murdered in this onslaught intentionally. They're starving them to death. They don't even give them water, and they're just murdering them. Uh, so okay, I just can't yeah. see how that's not war crimes. What is, the what I have a question is. 1,200 to 40,000? Think of the relatively. No, wait, 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 wait. They're an inferior hey. race. Oh, oh, the Philistines oh, are an inferior oh, race. Oh, oh, What's the proper proportion? Steve. What's How the proper proportion? What is it? Four so times? Maybe they should have stopped at a thousand. A thousand oh. people? But a thousand so Jews were killed. Yeah, right. Okay, Move so everybody completely out of Gaza and then really pulverize it. But get the human beings out of the way and then go in and, and get the, the mines and everything. They put and drop atom bombs on it. They got a few of those. Wait, 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 wait. Steve. They dropped leaflets. They made announcements. They sent text messages, the whole nine yards, telling people to leave the area. Now they told them to move south, where they still murdered them. Well, no, no. And then they told them when they were when then they told them to move south. And then when they had to attack the south, they told them to move back north. Don't get me wrong. It's like a ping okay, pong. Okay. Well, how many of that forty thousand were wait, wait, killed Steve, properly? Steve. Steve. <laughs> let me. How many of the forty thousand were killed you properly? You disagree with something I'm saying. The fact is, it's like a ping pong match, but there was advance warning given, which is something that's not a militarily logical thing to do. They couldn't get out of the way. To the enemy. They pushed them in further so down the into the Gaza the Strip. Is that the is the Israelis have done quite a bit. Whether or not they've done enough is is, is maybe in question, but they have done quite a bit certainly more than Hamas did, to give civilians a chance to get out of the way, however limited that those chances might have been. So the fact of the matter is you cannot compare Israel to Hamas. First of all, you can't compare them. In, you can't even compare the Netanyahu government to Hamas because I have seen uh, the Hamas educational materials, their, their children's television shows, it's about, it is the most racist thing I've seen from any, any governing party in the world today. And coming from it's an inferior race like that it is. And Naziistic racist. When you have children being told and, and celebrating and drummed into them that they must kill Jews. Not Israelis, Jews. I mean, Israelis are included in that. To me... That goes back to Nazi Germany. Mike, who's acting, like the, the, way, who's acting like the master race here? Excuse, what do you mean, who's acting who's, like Who's the, acting like the master race? Hamas. Who's the, no, they're Hamas. acting like the master race. Hamas 1, people. Israel okay. isn't. 
Oh, okay. They're and, not and acting like the master race. They're Israel bombing. is innocent. In, Israel okay. is innocent. Oh, but you, oh, wait, 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 wait. You only see is Israel in, you innocent? See? No, I is didn't say innocent? Israel is innocent. You I asked did. me who's acting like the master race. Right. Well, Israel is innocent here. Oh, do you mean do you mean if you're not acting like the master race, you're automatically innocent? Well, Israel is innocent, aren't they? They've done no wrong. Well, if you think so, that's fine. What do you think, I Mike? Didn't say that. What do you but think? If that's what you think, fine. Well, you're that's what I said. Opinion. What do you think? Well, Israel. What is, do I it, think? Israel I think has no that blame Hamas here. is more guilty. Hamas and Hezbollah, and to be quite honest, Iran are more guilty than Israel. This just doesn't okay. mean that Israel is guilt free. So, how many should Israel kill because of the guilt of these other parties? Well, actually, okay, wait a minute. Now, hold a minute. Wait a minute. Steve, if you ask a question, you got to wait until the person gives a full answer. You can't then jump in with another remark when they're half done. You got to do that, otherwise it, everything degenerates. Go ahead. What's a proper proportion? What's a proportional response, Mike? There is no proportional response, although there are people in the Arab world who said, uh, in the Arab world, in the past, not recently, who said, in order for Israel to um, to stop stop us from attacking them, they would have to kill at least ten times as many of us as we kill of them. Now, okay. I don't say I I don't say that should be that's something that should be used, um, and um, I don't say that that's what it, that Israel is using that. I hope not. But the fact is. Somebody in the Arab world several years ago said, yeah, the Israelis have to kill 10 times as many of us. Otherwise, we won't stop. Well, that was that person talking. So but the fact of the matter is, it's not a matter of how many more, how many of this. It's what are the circumstances? All right. You can say that the United States was guilty of war crimes. The United States and the allies during World War Two were guilty of war crimes. Because we killed more, so many more German civilians than American, Canadian, or even British civilians. We killed many more German civilians were killed. So are were we the bad guys? Is, is were the Nazis was Nazi Germany therefore on the uh, have the moral upper hand? The fact of the matter is. It's it's not a matter of if we are going to bomb somebody, if you're going to bomb a military or industrial target. That's what we did during the Second World War. Anything that would help their war efforts, but did not include targeting civilians. If you're not targeting civilians, and I know there were arguments that the RAF did target civilians during the war. They actually targeted infrastructure, which is resulted in the death of many civilians, but it wasn't designed to kill civilians. If you are targeting civilians, you can consider that. In other words, that's your target. That is terrorism. And that would be a war crime. If you are targeting a military base, which is in a civilian area, surrounded by civilians, in a densely populated area, but you must hit that base, then that is not, it depends upon how you do it, but it is not necessarily, it is certainly not automatically a war crime. And it's certainly not as much of a war crime as, as, as when you directly attack those civilians. Okay, could you clarify? It doesn't have to do with numbers. Numbers have to do with the, with the strength, the power of the country, of whatever country is doing it, and the facilities they have. So numbers, you can't just say, okay, we should only kill as many of these or as many of those. That's not how it works. And it's certainly not how it works in a war. Go on, Ken. I'm sorry. Oh, no, I, I, because you studied more of this legally. Um, you're saying that when you say war crime, you're talking about the Nuremberg trials or the UN status. Who's defining what a war crime is? Right now, what what rule are we going by? Because I hear so many radio programs where they say the United States is violating international law 
you know, the night is this guy's guilty of guilty of war crimes. Well, what are they talking about? You know, who says, because on the other hand, you say, well, the Palestinians and the UN said they have a right to use force to stop local oppression from uh, the IDF, you know, because people, uh, you know, force them to line up before they cross over to go to work in, in Jerusalem, whatever. They say, you can use force to resist occupation. So somebody's making up rules like in a, in a digital, in a, a, you know, a, a, what do you call it? A, a game, you know, the kind of games people, people play on the computer. You know, what do they call them? Not, not called digital games. I forget what they call, you know, video games. What do they, what do you call them? I'm sorry. I'm going to lapse video games, video games. Yeah. 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 They're making up rules for video games. You can kill three. If you kill three zombies, you get another 40 pounds and, you know, 40 cartridges for your gun. If you kill a monster or a troll, then you're going to get, you're going to be able to cure any kind of illness. You know, they just make up rules for the game. And then okay, grab- let's not use Nuremberg standards for assessing war crimes. Let's use Ken Ander- Ken Aaron standards for I'm war not, crimes. No, uh, who, I'm saying- who, is anybody committed any war crimes here in the Gold Gaza affair this last year? Most Anyone? countries, most countries in the last fifty years have committed war crimes. Most. What, countries. Is, what is Israel's war crimes here? Here, what? Well, that, that let's not judge that. Let's see what they've Why done not? in the past. Because First of all, too much in the uh, present. It's, Nobody it knows time to evaluate what was happening. War crimes, if something is a war crime, that yeah. means it has to be evidence has to be brought in, has to be tried. According to but that's my question is where are the standards coming for the protocol and the standards and the barriers and the. They brought Milosevic in from Bosnia and from Serbia and uh, convicted him of war crimes. Uh, can they do the same thing with Netanyahu if they can get a hold of him? I, I did a bunch of reports on trial? the International Criminal Court, and the problem was with the International Criminal Court, they wanted justice. Mostly they wanted to get uh, dictators who, you know, Idi Amin and so forth. But what happened was they were just going for celebrities in Africa. They didn't They didn't try to handle uh, Obama for his war crimes or Bush. Bush what killed, did Obama do? I think Bush killed a million uh, Iraqis in the, you know, the invasion of Iraq to get Saddam Hussein for who had, you know, uh, missile silos underneath the chicken coops or whatever he'd said. What did Barack Obama do? Uh, he uh, he attacked. Well, first of all, he he put out a hit squad to get rid of Osama bin Laden. But also, I'm not sure I wasn't keeping track, but he, he deported a lot of people. But he also uh, bombed, I think, Syria when they were fighting with ISIS. You know, because I even Trump did that. He, you know, took attacks on Syria, and and to get rid of the ISIS troops. I'm not. I'm, I didn't follow. I'm not like Mike and these other guys followed military. I think you might be right there. Uh, but you know, I'm, I, you can't be. Excuse me. You're not going to be the president of a country of 250 million people, who or 320 million people who wind up being the currently, whether you like it or not. The, the the best answer of a police force in the world and the kid to keep the lanes open people are going to die occasionally this way or that it's going to happen and uh, you know and it's going to be beyond regulations i don't even know when in historically all of a sudden the cia is shooting people they're supposed to be a central intelligence agency but somewhere i think it was the first iraq war they said oh the cia bombed this place when did they become an active military force? <laughs> Good question. And, you know, well, who the hell did that? It's kind of snuck up on us, you know, well, and, it was, and, I mean, and it's, I'm, and I'm not saying I could tolerate it if they were doing it covertly. And they said, oh, I hope you don't catch us. We're cheating. We're assassinating some people. But they were doing it overtly. They, they started yeah, well, as if they were the military. The CIA now has a military arm. By the way, there are, but, there are, um, um, war, in other words, laws that have been passed since Nuremberg on what is a war crime okay. that are accepted by a large amount of countries. There are countries that don't accept uh, don't accept that those definitions, and therefore they are ap- operating outside of that international, let's say, the inter- that particular international court. So, if you don't 
accept the agreed upon definitions of a war crime by that court, then um, by the same matter, you're not protected by them. So wait a I minute, mean, wait a minute. If that's another rule, you're saying under people who don't follow this don't get covered by it. Well, it's like an insurance. You're giving me standards like a contract. Who the wrote government, the contract? Who invented no, it? No, Ken, Ken. Governments that, in other words, if you are out, if you're not part of that, let's say there's an international court, and those people who adhere to the international court, they participate in in setting, defining what is a legally, according to the legalities of the international court, what is a war crime. Those people who are reject the international court, they don't want to participate. Obviously, those people, not in other words, those particular government or those particular individuals who reject that, obviously, they're not going to be covered by it. They're going to do whatever they want. Regardless. Okay, now that's your viewpoint. Is that, no, 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 no. Of, is that part of the contract? If you don't participate no. with us, you're not going to be protected by it. Well, obviously. I, I didn't say it. Don't say obvious, please. I'm, obvious. I'm, sure that, I'm sure Britain didn't operate that way when they, you know, they tried to conquer the world. They didn't see what, operate see what Daryl time. thinks. No, there That's was no Darryl. international war crimes court at that time. I'm just saying that there is an international war crimes. There, there are war things that have been defined as war crimes legally by an international court, starting back in Nuremberg with the Nuremberg uh, um, trials, but it went, it, it's still being, they're still setting new standards today. For instance, the use of um, napalm, which I don't know if that actually went through, but they were trying to get the use of napalm as a war crime. That'd be a good one. That's, that's one example of something that happened, let's say in the past 30 or 40 years. Um, so these, so whether or not something's a war crime, people use the term war crime all the time. Let's ask Daryl what he thinks a war crime is. Looking it up. Well, yeah, no, they should let be Mike finish it. and then Daryl will answer. They should be looking it up as to what is a war crime. Now, if you're saying that something is inhumane, that's an opinion, which you're certainly not, not only entitled to, but that should carry some weight. Um, if you're saying, if I feel something is inhumane, like I was talking about before, and I said the lack of civility, that's not a being in civil, uncivil is not a crime. I personally find it somewhat offensive, but that's my opinion. So we all can exercise our opinions. But when it comes to calling something a war crime, uh, I guess the only difference is what we should be saying is what this is, whether or not, whether it is or not, it should be a war crime. If you say it that way, you're covered. Okay. That's my point of information. Go on, guy. Okay, Daryl, what do you think? Um, who do you think should be responsible for declaring the protocol and standards of what is acceptable in war and what is a crime and should be punished just for its own occurrence? Who do you think should set that standard? That's a good question. Mm -hmm. It's what we've been wrestling with. Come on, Anytime Darryl. this month. You're now you're on. Who should set the set the standard for committing a crime? No, who should set judging what a crime? Organization should set the standards of what is in, considered an international law defining war crimes. Who should set that standard and say, well, these guys they turned around and you know in that movie <laughs> with Mel Gibson with uh, you know. They all turned around and lifted up their uh, kilts and showed the ra rear ends to the opposition. Braveheart. Braveheart. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Should that be considered a war crime? Or killing children? Is that a war crime? Who no, should showing somebody your ass isn't a war crime, Cam. It's not even a crime. <laughs> well, there you go. It depends on who sets the standards. It is no, it doesn't. Yes, it no, does. it doesn't. Okay. Idiotic things are not crimes. Okay. <laughs> Okay, that's fine. Yeah, but there are some countries in which it is considered a crime. That's right. So, I mean, Germany I mean, considered I mean, Germany infraction. considered having a payas and a and a big black hat as a crime. You know, Jews, and in and in and even in France, they considered wearing uh, headscarves as a crime. 
So don't tell me, you know, somebody lifting his skirts up might not be considered a crime. So, uh, Daryl, on your plate, who do you think should be responsible for defining war crimes that will be prosecuted in the international criminal court? Should it be the UN? Should it be uh, an elite group of judges? Where do you think those rules should come from? The rules should come from, from the participants who agree to abide by the rulings of the court. Okay, so that but the, the rules would apply to only those countries that agreed to abide by them? Yes. Okay, so therefore, if let's say uh, Saudi Arabia doesn't agree, then you can't prosecute them for any violations. Because they're not, they didn't agree to abide by these uh, regulations. No, you can't. Okay. No, because they're not under the jurisdiction. Of, look at the United States of America. Yeah. We're not under the jurisdiction of the court. That's and right. even if we thought about being under the jurisdiction of the court, we still pull up a big, big middle finger and tell them, do something about it. Yeah. Right. What you going to do? And if they hadn't done it, and if they didn't act that way, we would have been penalized and put in jail for Abu Ghraib, you know, torturing what is is Nicaragua and other places and killing yeah. a, million, a million Iraqis. So now, now the deal is on defending the United States of America. Oh, we didn't agree. We're not in your moral. See, there's a difference between ethics and morale. Right. Um, morale, moral. Codes. If you're not in the moral code, you don't care what the group is saying. That's why people. That's why we don't join anything. That's why we hardly ratify anything, and even when we do ratify it, we violate. It. Right. Now that may be coming to an end because of the internal machinations of the country depriving it of. It's worldwide superiority, right? So let's say, and this is this is what's taking me out because um, um, Aaron turned me on to this. Uh, Aaron um, De Reyes, I guess it is. Um, who's who's protecting the sea lanes? Who's responsible when the the Brits were no longer able? to come up with the capital to protect the sea lanes. Who protects the sea lanes? Well, I mean, the, people, the, people can, the most, the, the most common consideration is it's the United States Navy. As far as I can I, tell, I ain't nobody else out there. Who mm -hmm. else is out there? Oh, well, now China and, uh, you know, and, and Britain but and other people have Even boats. though they have more ships, they're not out protecting any sea lanes. That's right. Well, I don't, yeah, okay, maybe so not. So now, my understanding of the deal is, or was, and it continues to be, that, um, do you know what they call uh, uh, the, the, the standard form of trade internationally? What is that called? Uh, not common. Maritime law. Hmm. Nah. Oh, well, anyway, whatever the phrase is, and, and, I, and I, I really apologize for failing to use it, it becomes standardized. Now, you step outside of that, uh, the morality of the, those codes, you don't get to trade. And because the United States, in exchange for spending all that money controlling the... Uh, basically controlling the lanes of commerce that was the deal we'll protect your ships no matter what um now i don't think the uh, uh the al uh, what is it yeah uh, now i'll call them the houthis i hate that but that's what i'm gonna do i don't think the houthis got the mail but the deal is is that there are standards set up after world war ii and those were the standards that everybody built on. 
And until you change that, bricks, 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 until you change that, you got troubles. How can I take your, you have money stationed, stashed in my country to make trade easier. I get you angry and you say, I'm embargoing that money. And by the way, we're taking your oil gas stations too. But Maduro is a criminal? Now, he may be a criminal because he won't give up on this election. A lot of talk about this particular election. And a lot of talk about Nicaragua because Danny Ortega just put his brother in jail. Have not e in I have insufficient... Well, I'm really souring on Maduro's thing, but mm -hmm. I have insufficient mm -hmm. information to substantiate one way or the other, but I know it isn't correct to just snatch somebody's stuff because you got a gun. Mm -hmm. And that's what we do. How do you feel about Ortega now? I'm, I'm unclear. I, I, he, from back even before this late, this latest thing where his brother gets to go to jail, uh, I, I, I wasn't really a great Ortega fan after the first uh, revolution, after he was um, basically overthrown. What can be court, done about Maduro? Maduro? Any thoughts on what can be done about Maduro? Yeah, give him his money back and let him pump his oil. Give him his money back and let him pump his oil? Yeah, and sit go too. What What is our rationalization for doing that? We don't well, like you, his say you, have a, you say you have a problem on the border with Venezuelans coming across. They'll stay home if they have a way to eat. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, all these problems that we... All day deodorant. You... Smell amazing. Thank you. I need that. What? what <laughs> the was all that? day deodorant. <laughs> oh yeah. The sorry. deal is the, the, no. What are you sorry about? Well, it's it shouldn't. It's nah, come on. Don't be so strict. Okay. So well, you uh, actually, I'm, I'm kind of. What is that? What is that on your shoulder? Oh, this or is a, that part of the shirt? It's a trumpet. Oh, I thought you had. I, I thought you had a, a, it's a an Israeli it's, flag. Oh, no, no, sorry. it's a Scottish tartar, also known as a dish rag. <laughs> so I'm really yeah. impressed with uh, your practical, your pragmatic viewpoint on, you know, the reality of international relationships. Well, I mean, just look at it. Why are people coming here, even though they know this is a racist, non-democratic, crazy-ass nation? Because you got a shot. At least, at least as good as the lotto. And where you're living, totally under oppression, people driven crazy, shooting guns all over the place, raping women. I mean, you know, uh, look at the Congo. How many people have died in the Congo since 2000? And then at that point, it was pretty high. The, the death rate was pretty high. You don't hear it. People mumble. <laughs> What's happening in the Sudan? What's that all about? Two guys and you can't stop that? That's all it is. Two guys. One guy wanted to demote the other guy. He said, screw you. Let's blow up the country. Yay. Well, I mean, they were pretty wild bunch anyway. You know, you know what is it? Seven big wars going on right now. And we're, we're worried about Trump saying that the tour that uh, what's the name is the, the, the hurricane that's coming in. Morris Milton man. Milton Milton. Do you think Milton Bro would be proud of that hurricane? You bet your ass he would. And it's not even wearing a dress. So the deal is, as he goes on, the deal is we have the answers to the problem. And as much as people want to say that Putin's got something on Trump pissing over him or whatever it is. What the hell does BB Netanyahu have over Biden that he's getting ready to toss the election? What? Because What's he's in question? a bad spot. What, do you, what, what do you does BB ne Netanyahu have over Biden that Biden won't even consider cutting 
uh, well, the United I, States Palestinians some slack. Because they can, how can how can I vote for somebody? I heard this guy ranting this morning. And he said, "You want me to vote for someone who is responsible for half of my family getting wiped out?" And I think that's a stretch. Well, he had a conversation with Netanyahu for 30 minutes today. It's mentioned. Yeah, but look at the context of that, Steve. They're talking about Iran, Iran mostly, it says here in the article. Yeah, screw that. What is the context? Uh, Gavon was supposed to come meet with Austin, and they were supposed to lay out the plan. At the last minute, Netanyahu says no. Who's I Gavon? I need to talk to the president first. Is he the defense minister of Israel, Gavon? Mm-hmm. Okay. Right? Well, I think he's concerned about the Israelis hitting the Iranians too hard. Their oil facilities or their nuclear facilities. That's what they're worrying about. Yeah, but he said that out loud already. And 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 BB Netanyahu said, I ain't going to jail. Y'all y'all can do the nuclear thing if you want, but I'm not going to jail. Who would put him in and jail? It appears, hmm? Who would put him in jail? The Israelis. He's up for all kinds of corruption. That's why they would have. That's why they were changing the court. They they have charges against him in Israel. Yeah. No, I didn't. That's why they. That's why they wanted to change the court. Mm -hmm. And uh, so did, before Steve, um, and prior you know, to October seventh, the Israel. I'm sorry to interrupt, Daryl. Prior to October seventh, the main thing that was going on in Israel was that there were millions of people taken to the streets to protest Netanyahu because he wanted to change the court system. So that's the. Oh, I remember up. that. Yeah, I remember that now. Okay, sorry, Dad. Go on. In the mean, in the meantime, they were still raping the West Bank. Hmm. Maybe that's so why I mean, Netanyahu's doing what he's doing now. He's just going, finally getting a, a an opportunity to attack Hamas and Hezbollah and the West Bank and everything. And he knows he's going to be in jail afterwards, so he's got no limitations on what he's willing to do. Exactly. And I think that they're really afraid that he would go nuclear if these things didn't work out well. Uh, let me intercede. Can I intercede for a minute? Because I've, I've seen this amongst mostly this group. You keep uh, defining individuals' motivations on personal benefit. He's doing it for the money. He's doing it to stay out of jail. People operate on larger dynamics than just their own personal interests. They have their family. Sometimes they're considerate of their children or their brothers and sisters or parents. So they have a family, uh, things that they're concerned about. And sometimes they're actually concerned about their race or their tribe or their nationality. And I think, that, whatever their I think group Netanyahu is. is. And, then, and look at all the way. soldiers who go fight in the wars and get shot and killed for what? For the you know duty on a country, that kind of a thing. So people do operate beyond the thing about what am I going to get to eat tonight or how much money am I going to make. People operate for different goals. And yeah, you know, and then you know I'm just talking about sane people. Crazy people could you know just be operating for some kind of a thrill or a sensation or emotion. You know that somebody's talking to them. So you you have that factor too. That's never going to disappear in the human race and uh you know
the leadership, the, the main Zionist body, that was, they were trying to have a state in which, yes, every Palestinian who lived there could live there. It would be an Israeli state. They had to live a state of Israel. But they could live there so long as they accepted that state and the rules of that state. There were uh, this other, the Yabatinsky Zionists, um, actually even to the extreme of that, that formed an, not only, it wasn't not only the Irgun, it really was an offshoot of the Irgun called the Stern Gang, which is a very extreme, I mean, it was the most extreme group among the, uh, the Israelis before Israel became a state. They were the ones who actually did the Dir Yassin thing and wanted to drive all the Palestinians out. Now that, they said, well, we're Zionists. Well, that wasn't my form of Zionism. and It wasn't the form of Zionism that the overwhelming majority of Israelis um, agree to now. My fear is that with people like Ben Gavir and the uh, Netanyahu, Netanyahu is just an opportunist, but with people like Ben Gavir that he's got in the cabinet, who was sentenced and served time in Israeli prisons for his extremist view, not extremist views and extremist actions. He is a criminal in Israel and he's serving in the Israeli government right now. That his Zionism is in almost direct contradiction, God forbid contribution, direct contradiction to the form of Zionism and every Israeli that I know, no, that I've talked to or talking to, goes by. So you've got an internal battle there. So you can't just say the Zionists. The Zionists, uh, because you could be talking the Trump people or white supremacists in the United States and saying, well, that's the Americans. I mean, it was in the past, but, um, and I hope to God it isn't, doesn't come that way. Unfortunately, it represents too large a percentage of the United States for, for my taste, but uh, uh, for my liking. But the idea is you can't say you start talking about the Zionists. You better be specific. That's why I'm always careful to say the Netanyahu government. That's why I'm always careful to say Hamas and not Gazans, because I don't think that the vast majority of Gazans support Hamas. They, may, they, they elected them. They elected them by 90 percent. 43 percent. They got 43 percent. 43 percent? When, when 43. Election, what election was that? The only election they had in 2006. There hasn't been an election there since. No, wait wait a minute. There was a conflict between Hamas and Fatah. Yeah. In 2006, yeah. And there was a civil war between the two and Fatah lost. Did, there was an opposition party at one point. Did Fatah have the other 57% from the 43? Some maybe un it might have been undecided. Some might have supported neither of them. You know, when you have religious convictions and stuff like this, it's hard to get a political vote. You get a vote because it's your kin. Like, look at the voting in Michigan, where it's Muslim, and they vote, you know, they vote to keep uh, the, the, the uh, you know, I can't remember, now, the names are gone. The woman who's part of the squad. You know, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what they do. It's, you know, you don't violate your religion. You vote for your 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 kind, your clan. Well, also, yeah. Ken, it's a, when you have a parliamentary system, you have to understand a parliamentary system. For right. instance, Netanyahu has has not in recent years um, held, had the support of the majority of Israelis. Yet uh -huh. he is prime minister because he formed a coalition of, of parties. He's always had a, I mean, in his present incarnation, it's always been a minority government. Um, and that's one of the things he's concerned about. Oh, oh wait. Uh, yeah, but this is an interesting thing. So he's a, he's a real son of a bitch and a militant and everything, right? Now, he, he didn't, I mean, you could blame it. You could say, or some people have alleged that he set it up for Hamas and let them, gave them, you know, money and everything he knew they were going to attack that would allow him to counterattack. But um, he didn't plan that attack, I don't think. No. no so therefore, therefore, I don't think anybody said that, no. No, so, therefore, what I'm trying point, to say Jeff. is people after Bush was elected came 
And for some reason, the press put it, we're so lucky to have him. He's a tough guy. Imagine if we had, uh, um, you know, the- uh, Al Gore. Al Gore, he's a pussy. So, you know, now the, the Israeli public, there's gonna be a section similar. We, I'm glad I got a son of a bitch in here. He doesn't, he's not uh, empathetic. He doesn't have any mercy. He wants to destroy the opposition. He said, the first thing he said is, we're at war. This is war. Now it's the rules of war. We're not going to be moderate. We're not going to arrest. We're not going to take hostages or whatever he's planning to do. But we're going to use whatever we can to two goals to get the hostages back and eliminate Hamas. So it's, it's he's got to have some support for being a son of a bitch, nasty motherfucker militant because Wait. you don't want a pussy who's going to be a, a an appeasement guy or, you know, consider it and say, well, I'm looking at the humanitarian considering I want to be on the right side of history. No, I want I want the people to be protected. And I don't know why the press underplays, but people are going to disagree with me. But as far as I can tell, and I don't really have a side in the well, I do have a side in the war. I do have a prejudice. But it's there's no nobody's talking about the missiles that Iran fires, the missile that has Bilal files, the the attacks that, that uh, Hamas is still doing. They just don't talk about it, you know, because factually the Israeli army and their PR enabling people to act as their patrons and send them weapons and ammunition, they're much better at that. They have they have coin that they can call on because they deliver security to countries all over the world, you know, uh, technology. So they have allies everywhere. And the other, by the way, notice this, Steve, listen, when you come back, this is a remarkable thing that nobody's mentioned. The only countries that have contributed on the attack against Israel are the, uh, what's called the resistance allies, uh, the axis of the resistance, Yemen, uh, Lebanon, and Iran, and Hamas, you know, uh, the East Bank, the Gaza. Those are the only countries. Jordan's not coming in, Saudi Arabia, no Iraq, nobody else. Just covertly Iran through proxies. So if this was such a horrible, unbearable reality, those other countries would be doing something, let's say maybe not sending their own troops in, but, you know, sending airplanes or something. And the other Arab nations are not participating on the Arab side of this conflict. Isn't that true, Mike? Well, uh, no, they're not participating. That's true. And that, by the way, was a uh, a miscalculation on the part of uh, Hamas when they did this. And when and, you know, in other words, if if Hamas is doing this to provoke a disproportionately large large Israeli reaction, um, then they miscalculated because, no, Egypt isn't coming in. It doesn't mean that they're supporting Israel, but no, they're not right. supporting Hamas. And, um, and even Iran is, um, is not, I mean, one of the reasons they just launched those missiles, I believe, is because they were not supporting Hezbollah as much as um, Hezbollah expected them to. Um, so yeah, you do have, that was a miscalculation there and with all the uproar and the demonstrations and everything like that, no. Yeah. Right. And, and, and other than you and I just talking about that, I haven't heard a word about that. I haven't heard a word about the fact that all of those nations didn't do anything. You hear, you I know, have. U.S. shouldn't be supporting Israel, but you don't hear anybody saying, why isn't Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and you know oh, I've, other countries I've, supporting I've read the, articles, the Gaza. No, I've heard about it, Ken. That's why I I know about it. Uh, well, that's what I know. What I know. Um, no, I've heard that. Yeah. No. Um, it's. Uh, that's so you mean those there. countries are deliberately avoiding supporting the axis no. of resistance? Well, first of all, you got to remember that the another thing that has come up in the news, but not as much, admittedly. Um, is that a lot of these countries, their main concern is Iran. Um, Iran, which is not an Arab country, by the way, 
Well, it's yeah, right. It's a Caucasian Shiite. It's yeah. It's what used to be called in the um, <laughs> the euphemism was Persian. Right. Uh, but the fact that the they're worried about Iran gaining too much power and influence in the Middle East, and also about Iran getting if they get nuclear weapons, then they certainly will be exerting. Um, a large amount of power and influence in the Middle East, and they're concerned about that. So secretly, uh, according to a couple of the articles I read, secretly they're hoping that Israel um, gains the upper hand or or mitigates the uh, the threat from Iran. So you've got all these other power, I mean, power brokerings going on in, in the Middle East. The... Um, <clears throat> It's more than just about, you know, everybody says, oh, it's about Israel and Hamas and et cetera. You have to remember also that before the Six Day War, um, so before Israel occupied the West Bank and they only had half of Jerusalem, they didn't even have the half where the holiest uh, Jewish sites were, which is what they have now, which I don't think they're going to ever give up so they can anybody can hang that up but but even the rest of the west bank israel just had what they had in 1948 and even then there were organizations the plo which was formed from the from um um Fatah and all these other organizations that were trying to that were attacking israel that were you know forming terrorist raids not to the extent, same extent, but trying to attack Israel. So the there's a difference between those of us who support a two-state solution and those people who are just trying to eliminate Israel. By the way, a lot of those organizations were funded by a by the several dozen Nazis that escaped justice. At Nuremberg, they got out through the rat line to Egypt, primarily Egypt and Syria, um, oh. and they set up these these training programs for terrorists. Based, it was based on the werewolves from uh, Nazi Germany. Okay, so there's a direct lineage back to the Nazis there. That when did they do that, this, Mark? What? When did they after World War Two? When did they do this? Right after World War Two. There was no Arab Jewish uh, squaring off until Israel happened. There well, was no were, hostility of the Arabs to the Jews or the Jews to the Arabs. No, the Nazis, what, what happened is these Nazis, one of them was Skorzeny, who was fairly capable of all of them. He was probably the most capable militarily. Um, the rest, I don't know about. But um, um, no, they escaped to these countries. Then when Israel, I mean, and they were actually promoting activities against the Jews living there before Israel became, an, became a state. When it became a state, they started promoting um, organizations to, this went on between 1945, late 1945, obviously effectively 1946, until uh, 1953 and 1954. Um, I think it started to peter off after that because some of these Nazis were no longer capable. Some of them. Where were, were they doing this? You say in Syria. What? They had in training Egypt camps Syria in Syria. Primarily. They were. They were. They escaped to Egypt and Syria primarily. Um, a lot of them went to South America. You know, the rat line went all over the place. Some but, went to Antarctica. Um, well, if you can find them there, that's great. I don't think the Mossad's looking in Antarctica, but but they certainly were looking, and they managed to catch a few of them. That's why in the mid fifties or something, some of them decamped for South America to join others who had already escaped to South America. I, I got to interrupt for a second. We've been talking about Jews and and is and Zion for way too long here. I want to bring in. I want to ask Mike a, a question. It's got not Mike, Daryl. Daryl, have you experienced anything historically comparable to this conflict that the uh, that the Zionists and the Jews seem to be struggling with for the last 75 years? Anything else, any other 
cultural phenomena or military or national phenomena like that? Living in the United States of America. United States of America. Expound on that. Well, let's see. I live in a democracy. And I'm supposed to have the rights of a citizen. Yet that hasn't been my experience. Yeah. I I was citing Governor Kemp of Georgia, who driven almost, what, 400,000 people off of the voting rolls. And the Republicans are getting away with this in a lot of states. And a lot of them are are either black or, or Hispanic. You know, people that are probably won't vote for the Republicans. Are you aware of this? Are you guys aware of that? Of course we're aware. They're all immigrants, and they're trying to vote with that $100,000 that the Democrats gave them to come here and uh, to overturn the election. Who who, who got 100000 No, that's what the Republicans the claim. They claim that we get, the Democrats are giving them $100,000? That's what uh, President DJT says. Well, what what uh, what about driving people off of the list? Like when Sean, when Kemp was the Secretary of State, it was like over a hundred thousand people they eliminated, and that's why he beat Stacey Abrams to become governor of Georgia. I mean, it's utterly outrageous, and it's just going on all the time. The Republicans are doing this for over twenty years. So, when are the Democrats going to get up and say something? Well, I don't see why this isn't a crime. Isn't it a violation of the Fourteenth or Fifteenth Amendment? To, to compromise people's voting rights and to do it blatantly as the state, uh, you know, as the state over them doing this? I yeah. wouldn't ask the current Supreme Court that. Pardon me? I wouldn't ask the current Supreme Court yeah, that. Right. I mean, I, I just want to interject um, um, in agreement with Daryl that, yeah, who's going to enforce those laws. You need somebody to enforce them. Well, this is over 20 years. It's been happening maybe 30 years that it's been going on, so it's been different Supreme Courts. But even this Supreme Court, are they going to find that the Secretary of State could do that? They're eliminating people the same first and last names with different middle names? They say they're registered in a different state? State, give it back to the states. That's what this Supreme Court is doing. Give it back to the states. What happened with the abortion issue? We're at, we're, is the state is the malfeasance here. The state is the perpetrator. The state is the guilty party. The only place to judge that is in the Supreme Court. It doesn't matter to them. Well, it, it didn't matter. matter maybe it doesn't them. matter to this court, but it did matter to a court that was there 20 years ago or 10 yeah, years ago. Right. How are they able to do this and not be like, cold on the carpet? The Republicans have been the minority party ever since the Great Depression. And and they they have they have to make up for it because they do not have the majority of the votes. Occasional have breakthroughs. Nixon and Reagan had a, a landslide, you know, people liked them returned into office, but the Republicans are always the minority party because they have a minority political agenda. At least the Democrats have an, an a more inclusive one. Well, you, you do remember when the United States government had to call in federal troops to desegregate uh, um, the schools based on Brown versus Speaker Board of Education, right? The University of Arkansas, I think, was one. Alabama was another one. Right, uh, Mississippi. And, Mississippi. Um, and Alabama, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, so the idea is the federal government um, does step in when the Supreme Court rules on it, but the United States as a whole all branches of it has been avoiding the issue. This country has yeah. been you're talking about denying African Americans the vote or cutting back on their voting rights. That it's not the last thirty or forty years. It's since the inception of this country. Um, I mean, even back in the day when you had slavery, there were free there were free blacks, as they called them. African Americans who were freemen, who were still denied the vote. Well, all right, I appreciate your, your your historical perspective, Mike. But this is going on right now, and even in Georgia in in two thousand twenty, they were not they st- 
Trump still needed 12,000 more votes, even though they'd driven hundreds of thousands of people off of the voting uh, list. So Georgia really turned precipitously against the Republicans, finally. But finally. We, well, yeah, but what's going to happen, especially in these battleground states, uh, especially ones that had Democratic governor or Republican governors? That's why I feel that's why I, I feel that racism is something that must be constantly fought because we're not, we're not out of the uh, people thought that when Obama got elected. I mean, I spoke to people who thought that that they said, oh, well, we're now in a post racist society. Huh. <laughs> no. So I should mean, we fight racism here by putting Kemp in prison where he belongs? Good luck. Yeah. Well, I, I'm looking at justice. I think you all agree with me on it. But how come yeah. we were so, uh, you know, ill-equipped and uh, so poignant? Uh, we don't have the strength to do it. Well, there's I mean, it is an obvious democracy. crime, but the Republicans are able to do this constantly. There's flaws in our democracy. The whole electoral system was based in part on making sure on uh, maintaining the uh, uh, the maintaining slavery okay so the idea that um i mean this is an imperfect democracy to put it mildly. well i i'm so, so a real quick close on that if it wasn't for maintaining slavery there's no way south carolina would have joined the revolution because their entire economy is plantation uh agriculture and they needed cheap labor to do that and there's a good chance that Virginia wouldn't have joined either. So in order yeah. to have those colonies join, they had to let them keep slavery. Yep. Yeah. And the question is, was it worth it? Well, it would have been a whole different world today if we were still a British colony. Yeah, well, Canada is uh, really not a British colony, but it's part of the British Commonwealth. Member of the Commonwealth. Yeah. They're still subjects of the uh, of the crown. You could say uh, we're part of the Commonwealth too. We have our unique relationship with Britain, Canada, yeah. Australia, and New Zealand. But we're not subjects of the crown. Um, not but, directly. But Canada, Canada is, and they seem to have a um, very similar. Uh, I mean, even though it's a parliamentary system, etc. But functionally speaking. Their democracy and their republic is, or constitutional monarchy is, um, functions pretty well on a day to day level, the same as ours, actually better. I'm not saying they don't have racism, uh, but uh, it's not as bad as here. Do you know that every president has been related to uh, Elizabeth II? Every president we've had been related yeah. to the British monarchy, oh. except yeah, one, we're... except one. And Obama was not the one. He was related to the Queen through his mother. Yes. Um, it was well, Martin Van Buren, to... who was pure Dutch. He was the only president that wasn't related to Queen Victoria and Queen Elizabeth. But the fact is, we're not, when they talk about it, um, we're not part of a monarch. Uh, um, um, part of a monarchy. Constitutional mm -hmm. monarchy, yeah. Right. Um, we're a republic rather than a constitutional monarchy, but it pretty much well amounts to the same thing. So if the United States had um, not become a separate country and had remained part of British Amer North America, um, then we still might be an extremely powerful country. And who knows, it might have split off. Right? We, we don't know. This is a uh, counterfactual you know, history. Um, uh, what would have happened, what could have happened, or whatever. I think because of the natural resources here, um, if it was, this is called British North America, we would still have a dominant say, maybe not as dominant, but um, a, a dominant say of what was going on, especially within the British Commonwealth or the British Empire, so to speak. So we don't know. We don't know what would have happened. But the, obviously, but the uh, but the fact is uh, that was the fact that we made that compromise on slavery, claiming to be 
claiming to fight for freedom, individual rights, and human rights, but the country kept slavery. I don't know. That was a pretty bad deal, in my well, opinion. They, the, 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 the revolution was more important to him. Also, bear in mind that Abraham Lincoln said that he would permit slavery if if the union could be preserved. You know, he was willing to to uh, stay with slavery, but he could not allow uh, the states to separate into different 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 nations. Yeah. Little known fact about Abe. <laughs> yeah, doesn't. Uh... I, 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 that doesn't uh, raise his uh, ratings. Um, Two I, states were northern states that were slave states. Both Delaware and Maryland were slave states. What Kentucky? Uh, Kentucky well, they were state. they were a border state, it, but they were they were in the Union, and they were the last state to give up slavery. Uh, how was that? Didn't slavery end with the? the 13th amendment and they were the last one to abide by it <laughs> oh well, i thought texas uh with juneteenth well, came later <laughs> yeah, it was when the last uh, um i'm talking about by states right. that's when juneteenth it wasn't it was one area of texas yeah um and, but i think missouri was a slave state too if i remember yes right. but missouri was uh i don't know so missouri. those border states yeah there were four border states that were like and that. by the way when he in, um, um, issued the Emancipation Proclamation, it did not free slaves in the North. Right. Only in the Southern states. Correct. So, yeah. He when, didn't want to alienate his allies. He had a war to win yet. <laughs> yeah, he had a war to win. Exactly. People make compromises in in wars, etc. But Oh, yeah. Um, but after the war, what about Jim Crow? I mean, in other words, so everybody was slaves were free, but were they really free? No, no. Uh, and Jim Crow, as far as I'm concerned, is still going on, as you rightly pointed out. From 1868 to eight to 1876, things were going relatively well. Yeah, that's true. That is true. Yeah, they it wasn't the, the the Tilden Hayes compromise until. They withdraw the, the troops. I mean, I was really surprised to find out that New York City wanted to go join the Confederacy. That New, New York, York what? New York City wanted to be part of the Confederacy. Oh, boy, that just... Oh God. How's that? What, what, what do you mean? Who told you that? Well, I, yeah. I met a guy yesterday who said, y'all, motherfucker, from New York. But he said, y'all. So I guess It's in the history. It's an Imagine history. that, a, a New yeah. York. Uh, yeah, how would New York City, not New York State, join the the uh, Confederacy? Uh, anything can happen. No, do not everything can happen, Ken. Well, you know about the reality. reality. But I you know about that. the draft riots. <laughs> okay. The, the draft riots when That's a good point. Americans were drawn, literally drawn and quartered in the streets of New York. All right, you're right about that. That was horrible. <laughs> Once again, everything comes from the preconditioning of the people who commit the acts of insanity. So what caused the draft riots? The people who were in the streets didn't see any way of getting out of fighting in the war because right. they didn't have $300. Yeah. So I mean, and if you go, if you keep going back, you know, why does Palestine have to pay for the sins of Nazi Germany and then get called Nazis anyway? Well, actually, that what what I was referring to before was certain Palestinian movements, certain yeah, movements in the Palestinian communities. This doesn't mean that the. That's why I was I was talking about the fact that. Hamas won their only election, the only election they had, with 43% of the vote. What about that other 57%? They did not wholly support Hamas, but they've been living under Hamas since that time. And are they to blame? 
No, I mean, you know, they didn't but ask see, for that. I'm more concerned about when you when you calculate how much food an individual uh, will be sustained on and, and, how, and how you control the commerce of an area and then blame them for being bitter. <laughs> no, you know, to be quite honest with you, it's the power structure. Uh, again, it always comes down to the, the old thing, which is that the people who are, who are caught in the middle. So you have, um, you had groups that were trying to, um, in, in the fifties, in the late forties, fifties and early sixties, up to the six day war, you had groups that were trying to eliminate Israel as, as it existed at that time. And then, but they didn't, did they make up the majority of the Arab world or the Palestinian people? Obviously not. Otherwise, there would have been millions of them when there were only thousands. So you have you have smaller groups, and now you have the Netanyahu government, which is a minority government. I, forgetting about, if you can, forgetting about the war for a second, but the Netanyahu government is setting the policy for a population of which they only represent the minority. So you have always this situation in which you got the people on the ground, the regular people. I mean, the, the people who were um, killed on October 7th in that uh, music rally, that was really a, a peace rally. They were probably by and large because they were they were against the policies. It was supposed to be there were supposed to be protests against the Netanyahu government's policies in the West Bank, et cetera. And again, they're the ones that got killed. The ones, people in Hamas who are living in houses um, in which Hamas has set up a base, they can't say to Hamas, I don't want you in my, in my apartment building because Hamas would kill them. So they're stuck there. The innocent people are always the ones who bear the brunt, and that is the shame of politics and war, at least today. It's um, the innocent people are always going to pay the price, to especially when they are not the controlling interest in the government. I mean, in Lebanon, you've got Hezbollah. They don't represent, I I don't believe, I haven't seen any hard facts and figures recently that they represent the majority of Lebanese people. I know plenty of Lebanese people that do cannot stand Hezbollah. They're not Lebanese. They don't have Lebanese citizenship. Hezbollah? There are about 4 million Lebs Lebanese, <laughs> and maybe a million, million in, in Palestinians. The, well, no. but the fact is that they are there are people in Lebanon who are receiving the brunt of the fighting who are not or put it this way if not the brunt there are certainly many people in Lebanon who are getting killed who could maybe don't even couldn't even stand Hezbollah but True. they they're in the wrong place at the wrong time the Jordanians threw out all the Palestinians that were in camps in, in Jordan at one point like 20 years ago but uh, Lebanon, you know, it's been its own situation. They've had to tolerate them, and they're a sizable part of the population now. But they're not right. Lebanese citizens. No, but the idea is... Well, the how can you be a member of parliament if, if, if you're not a citizen? You said there are Palestinians in parliament in Lebanon? There, there are Hezbollah. There are 13 there Hezbollah. Hezbollah. 13 Hezbollah members are, are members of Lebanese of, parliament. Well, I stand corrected. Obviously, yeah. they're citizens. Yeah. <clears throat> well, you know, they I mean, when 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 they came in, obviously, there are a lot of Palestinians that are citizens. Um, yeah, the, the Palestinians in Lebanon mostly came after a civil war in Jordan. Jordan kicked them out. They went to Lebanon. Wow. Although a lot okay. of Palestinians remained in, in Jordan. Yeah. I have to remember something. Nobody for a while, nobody wanted the Palestinians. Right. It um, hasn't changed. Palestinians were supposed to have a state in 1948 alongside Israel. Right. Um, that you can't really you can't blame the Israelis for. 
you can blame like the Stern gang for driving Palestinians out of some Palestinians out of Israel, but a lot of them fled they because fled. they were sold. Oh, oh by the way, there was concurrent 750,000 Jews kicked out of our, uh, Arab, countries. Arab yes. countries. I think uh, not all of them went to Israel, you know. No, but they there were expulsions in in, in 1948, there were expulsions from many of the Arab countries, actually prior to 1948 also. Yeah. And again, a lot of um, the vast majority of Arab countries did not want to take any Jews escaping from Nazi Germany. Yeah. Um, well, but then know. again, nobody else in the world did either. Um, you know, if you're the chosen is, people, there's some overhead involved. <laughs> yeah. But the thing is that What's happening now is, I mean, the Palestinians are be really being used as a pawn. Yeah. Um, and I really don't believe that. Um, would Iran be helping the Palestinians if it didn't serve Iran's purposes? Would they be doing it out of altruism? What do you think uh, Iran's purposes are? Iran's purposes are to uh, are to have the prior, prime power be, to be the prime power in the Middle East. Why do right. you say that? That's because what that's what they said. Yeah, yeah they said uh, that. When they say that, yeah. back in what, the eighties, they, they said they want to be the prime power in the Middle East. Yeah, they wanted to. It's there's. You see what's happening with Iran. Um, you also have forgetting about Israel for a second. You have a Shia Sunni uh, problem as well. Right. So. Who's going to be controlling the, shall we say, the even even allowing Israel to exist and in whatever borders it wants, the rest of the Middle East, who is going to be control? Who's going to control right. Islamic holy sites? Steve, right now? Steve, don't you remember the war between Iraq and Iran when right. when Kissinger said, "Quiet, leave them alone, let them kill each other," yeah. and they did. And they killed they about eight hundred thousand. It's like a birthday present. <laughs> yeah. That's well, to said. Kissinger was, not yeah, to the Kissinger, people in Iran. Right, Iraq. The, and the Iranians were desperate to get ammunition and spare parts from us because their entire military was American. Right. And they were right. totally alienated from the Americans, and now they had to fight the Arabs. It was probably a good time for the Iraqis to attack them, because, considering they were up against the wall in those respects. But they did. They underestimated the Iranians. I, I I had heard that the the major cause of the conflict was info uh, that Iran did not want infiltration of Iraqis coming into Iran. The Iraqis attack the part of Iran that, that is inhabited by Arabs. It also happens to be one of the richest oil districts in the area. So yeah. they wanted to reacquire that territory that was inhabited by their ethnic uh, population. The Iranians stopped them from doing that. And after 800,000 men died, the border ended up in exactly the same place. Yeah, yeah. And also you have to remember that, we, in other words, even if it looked like one side or the other was winning, we would, and, and many countries in the West, would tip the balance back. In other words... We want, we the, want, the, con we want the conflict to yeah. continue. We want the contra uh, the contract. You want them busy fighting each other or, or trying to compete. Defense contractors do because they've got lots of weapons to sell. Yeah. And the Americans give foreign aid to these countries, and that foreign aid is turned around and goes to our defense contractors to give them weapons. Right. That's the real perversion of this. And we got a thirty-five trillion dollar national debt that threatens the currency itself. Right. What a great position to be in. And we want Donald Trump heading up the next government with these parameters. Yeah, well, Donald Gump, Trump, Gump. It's I like Donald Gump. Gump. That's a good name, uh, Donald yeah. Gump. <laughs> Donald Gump. <laughs> if we get him for another four years, I mean, this is just my opinion. It may sound very dark or something. I don't know if the United States, I'm not saying, you know, it's a guarantee but there is a, a distinct chance that the United States won't survive. Oh, yeah, that's a unique concept. I heard that well, Donald Trump, once, a, once an hour. Donald Trump says if he's not elected, we won't have a country anymore. Yeah. He well, says that all the time. I don't know what we're going to have if we don't have a country, but Donald Trump says it's going to be gone. Mm -hmm. just, just remember about Donald Trump. 
when Donald Trump says somebody else is going to do something, it means he's going to do it. <laughs> so, mm. if, and when whenever Donald Trump says if she gets elected, we won't have a country, I know that's what's going to happen if Donald gets elected. <laughs> so, uh. but but whatever. Well, whatever. Wes, you know, we 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 should take advantage of Steve. I I hope you don't mind my uh, asking you this, but. Oh, I think it's getting late enough to end this, right? So uh, is there anything in the charts that predicts who's going to win the election? Oh, we keep talking about it. Um, actually, what shows up in the astrological charts is is, is uh, turmoil, and we're getting a lot of that. It's unsettled. There, there are opposing forces. And uh, I was just there last night, and Carol Riders, and we weren't looking at the election, though or we, we we're looking at it most. But yeah, what we see is turmoil and, and, and trouble and, and after the election too. So whoever, if, if Trump loses this one, then he, he's going to be up to new antics, but it's going to be to the same end to try and weasel his way into power. But hopefully if he does lose, we can be done with the Donald Trump era once and for all. Uh, well, we'll be done with the Donald Trump as president era. Yeah. Maggots will still be out there. Yeah, maggots are everywhere, unfortunately. I think JD takes over. Well, we'll see. Oh. It's the, only, awful close. Is the only thing that's keeping the United States in power, other than the military, <laughs> is the reserve currency. And so who's preparing for stopping that, right? The brick yeah, nations, I mean, exactly. Is that that's what Trump wants to do? Give it away. Well, I think the brick countries, especially if they're expanding now, they want to come up with an alternative reserve currency, and that's going to further undermine the dollar. The dollar is under severe threat. Uh, I, I don't know what to say about it. I've been a tax accountant for forty years. I, I know that rich people are are getting away with not paying a lot of uh, tax money. And I know that the Democrats, especially if they're returned to power, they're going to ramp up the IRS and try and get people to pay taxes again and all sorts of different fronts. Things are changing in that respect. So, well, I don't know. What you think they're going to get that much? Do you think they're going to get that much support in the Congress and the Senate? For uh, taxation? No, I'm talking about numbers. I don't you, see the Democrats walking away with 54 Senate seats and uh, what is it, uh, three? I think it, the Republicans are looking at 51 or 52 uh, Senate seats, but it'll be a majority. Uh, it Absolutely. looks almost certain. The only thing that could happen there is they can unseat Ted Cruz in Texas and Tim Scott in uh, in Florida. They're within range and they're pouring a lot of money in there. Ted Cruz almost lost to Beto O'Rourke uh, six years ago. So they would need to have that, and they'd have to hold on to ones like John Tester in Montana, and they've got this Navy SEAL running against them that all the all the right-wingers love up there. So I, I think he's going to be gone. And Sheriff Brown should hold on in, in Ohio, but I think the Republicans are going to have 51, 52 seats. But we could get the House. And it's going to be depending on where people's attitudes are. Something big could happen in the next month here that could tilt the election. Something that looks really embarrassing to the Republicans or really embarrassing to the Democrats. So stay tuned for an October surprise. Yeah. Okay. We're already. Which well, side? Which side? Kamala? Kamala? Or well, I hope Kamala because I can't stand Donald Trump, period. Oh, okay. I hope Kamala has a uh, doesn't have a uh, an embarrassing moment. Right, and and she's really hitting the talk circuit. She's on a major television show every day, and yeah. she's and she's uh, report. Uh, uh, com she's coming across very well. Br so brilliant far. woman, brilliant woman. Okay, yeah. All right. Anybody else parting words? I got to You know, this is like having a bunch of kids. You got to. <laughs> well, I just hey, want to say you. that. I wish we had a bigger audience because we we, we touched on a lot of interesting subjects. We okay, did. Good. Okay, well, we'll have a bigger and, audience. And, and I apologize for any offense that I've given. Uh, I regularly do. It's March conjunct my ascendant. What can I say? 
Uh, <laughs> all right. We'll let you go this time. <laughs> Thank you. All, all right, right, gentlemen. We'll see you soon. You've been watching Going Viral on 9 October 2024. The guests tonight were Ken Aaron here in Los Angeles and uh, Steve Kaiser in Los Angeles and Daryl McPherson and Mike Jackowitz in, in uh, New York City. Jim uh, Dingman popped in for a little bit and didn't hang out too long. I think that's it. Okay, so hope to see you next time.